Each week, Richard and Father Mark present a rigorous discussion of the Bible in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. Over 24,000 episodes are downloaded each month at no charge. Please consider marking your level of support with a one-time donation or by pledging a small amount per episode. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. After spending the better part of 12 chapters putting the church's household in order, in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, St. Paul crowns the power structure he established with something more excellent and of greater importance than any household station or duty, the act of love. For scripture, how we treat others is not just a litmus test, it is the only test of our knowledge of the commandments of God. For if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Richard and I continue our reading of St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. You're listening to the Bible as literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 116 of the Bible as Literature podcast. We have reached chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. And for the last 12 chapters, Paul has been leading us through calisthenics about how to conduct yourself so that you are in a frame of mind and you are behaving in such a way that your actions do not cause division, but instead produce the love of neighbor. Love ultimately is the fruit of the commandment that Paul is seeking in this letter. And all along, Paul has been emphasizing you have to have the correct priority. 1 Corinthians is about priorities. And if your priority is correct, if your priority is the commandment, which is the commandment to love, which is the law of Christ, as he explained in Galatians, then suddenly the path becomes clear And as the Lord promises in the Psalms, he can protect your footsteps because you're walking the path according to the commandment. And so much of this book has been looking at alternatives to unity of the community and then breaking those down. So-called wisdom, so-called knowledge, community recognition, so many different pursuits that people undertake. And he's been breaking them down one by one as ultimately destructive to the community. And this is something that we really need to take seriously. If we are not pursuing unity of the community, unity of our households, unity of our friendships, unity at work, unity within our country and within our communities, if we are not looking for unity, what are we looking for? And Paul will break it down and show that it's simply selfishness. And the way that Paul breaks it down doesn't allow for Minnesota nice. Unity does not mean being conflict or risk averse. It means complete engagement with the other person and everything that's going on. Which means accepting conflict and accepting adversity and submitting to it. It's different than just wanting everyone to get along and not wanting problems. Wanting everyone to get along and not wanting problems is what produces tyranny in the third world because you have one society that just wants to get along and everyone be quiet and be happy and they're willing to do anything to achieve that. That's not the end that Paul is fighting for. That's why it's not just unity, but love. Wanting everyone to get along is comfort for me. It's ultimately selfish. This is why Paul is fantastic. Anything that is not true unity of the community he will break down. Because when I say, I want everyone to get along, well, what happens if there's a problem? Maybe they should stop fighting. If they have a fight, let them fight. Who am I to say that they need to stop fighting? This is the problem. I am more willing to say they are supposed to stop fighting because it's for my comfort, ultimately. Why do I want everyone to speak English around me? Because that way I can understand them. Why do I want everyone to change the way they do their job? Because I want it easier for me. Whenever I say they should, it's ultimately for my own comfort. What's so interesting about 
Paul's methodology here as the pedagogos, which is one of the many roles he assumes in the letter. He is showing you that all you need is love. I hate to say it, but the Beatles were correct. All you need is love. Where the Beatles were incorrect is they thought of love as something you can just feel and have. And Paul is saying, no, love is something you do. And it may require that the pedagogos crack the whip to get you to do it until the action of love becomes muscle memory. Scripture is about producing muscle memory so that at some point you become an automaton who is always in the mode of loving irrespective of feelings. When you say, I love someone or I don't love them, if your reference is how you feel, it can't be love. No, when we say the reference point is love, oh, here is Christ crucified. Now, what were you saying about love again? <laughs> this is what it means to love. Love is being willing to completely submit your will. This is why it's the opposite of everyone getting along. Because wanting everyone to get along is ultimately for my comfort, whereas love is ultimately for my submission. And if you are loving the way that Paul is commanding us to love, most of the time, you're not going to have good feelings. Most of the time, you're going to have to battle Satan in your own ego, who's telling you, no one appreciates you, no one understands you, no one cares about you, no one hugs you, no one sees your value, no one listens to you, no one wants to understand what you're trying to say. All of this should have stopped when you turned 17. But since you have money and comfort and peace, it didn't stop when you turned 17. Because we are in an environment of selfishness and egoism. So that we've come to a point when people talk about falling out of love and at the same time are so insecure they have to say I love you to everybody 15 times a day as though it matters what they say. It doesn't matter. You don't fall out of love. You stop loving and it's not about how you feel. It's about how you act towards the other. You stop taking the actions of love. So let's talk about what Paul considers still a more excellent way than what he's been describing in all of these different gifts and the hierarchy of gifts. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And here he's saying, whether I speak like an apostle, the divine word, or whether I just talk like the average human being with cheap eloquence, which is how the patrician speaks in the Sympotine, it's just noise if I'm not doing the commandment of God. Unpleasant noise. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge. And this is a dig against the elite in the church who read all of the books and the articles and who are theologically sophisticated and, according to Paul, full of baloney. And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And this is Ecclesiastes 101. You are passing away. The only thing that counts is the commandment and the judgment of God. And Paul is explaining the Torah, that the commandment and the judgment of God is the care of the neighbor and fellowship with the neighbor. That's the only thing that makes you worth something because it connects you to the one who does not die, who is everlasting. And there's an irony, too, that he uses here, which, as we've said many times before, Paul is completely trying to reconstruct and deconstruct your understanding of power. If I have all mysteries and knowledge and have faith to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing which is exactly the opposite of how human beings think. Because when he talks about love, he is referring to a complete subjugation of the ego, of the self, of the person. So now you're nothing. But only if you love to the point of being nothing do you have a chance of being something. But all the things that would impress people around you, like being able to speak eloquently, being able to profess all sorts of mysteries and knowledge, the things that would make somebody something in the community, 
those are the things that make you nothing unless you make yourself nothing. Why is this? Because it's the word that is something. The one who carries the word is nothing. We have these ancient texts printed in clay, the Cyrus Cylinder, for example, that have these messages about Cyrus the king. Who is the guy that delivered that to him? We have no idea who the guy was who delivered it. We never will know who delivered it because it's only the word perpetuated in clay that made it to today. Now, that's word in clay. These are words that are even more eternal. That cylinder, if Isis gets a hold of it, is destroyed. But this is a word that continues on forever. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Again, this is Ecclesiastes. You can do all these things under the sun, but at the end of the day, without the Lord's judgment, without the Lord's wisdom, it's empty. And the Lord's wisdom for humanity, as we've said many times, is to fill the vacuum of the human condition with the commandment to love. If Superman wants to use all of his power and his strength and his special abilities to defeat the enemy, even if he dies, when he uses his super strength, it's an exercise of his ego. What is Superman if during the film he says there's this giant monster who's smashing the city? That monster is actually a person. I am responsible to love that monster. And so therefore, I'm going to go face him and let him kill me in the hope that he will turn from his wickedness and live. Guaranteed zero dollar profit at the box office if that were the Marvel narrative. Love is patient. Love is kind. And is not jealous. Love, O Corinthians, does not brag and is not arrogant. And if I have to brag in order to make you stop bragging, that's what I'm going to do. If I have to be impatient as a teacher in order to teach you patience, that's what I'm going to do. That's the irony of the pastoralia of 1 Corinthians. He's going to teach you how to be patient with the monotony of scolding. He's going to teach you how to be humble by imposing tyranny. But the tyranny he imposes isn't to control you, it's to set you free. That's the tyranny of God in the wilderness in Exodus. It's better and more excellent and more beautiful than the tyranny of Pharaoh by leaps and bounds. Teaching is not necessarily the route to glory and acceptance and appreciation. But when I love my children, my goal is to teach them. How they treat that, how they react to that, that's their problem. But I'm not allowed to stop teaching them. This is the patience and this is the kindness that I have to continue in if I'm going to teach my children. You can be kind to your children by yelling at them and being stern with them. This is the wisdom that's missing from our culture today. Paul is saying we have to be kind if we're loving and patient. But what does that mean? You have to be functional in your thinking. Sometimes kindness comes in the form of the staff. And sometimes brutality and cruelty comes masked as kindness. In Minnesota, where we care so much about liberal values and making sure that everyone is nice to each other and that sort of thing, we have the biggest achievement gap in the United States. Where is our niceness getting us? Is it really getting us to love? Maybe, maybe not. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, whether it's seeking something for the ego or for the tribe or the clan or the nation. Love is not provoked. People can do anything to you. If you are under the control of God, you don't react in response to what people do to you. You only react according to the commandment because sometimes you have to be provoked. Again, I want people to understand what's going on here with wisdom. You should never yell at your children when you're actually angry. You should decide when it's appropriate to yell and yell when you're not angry. This is such an important point. If you are not a play actor, you are not a teacher or a parent. If you don't know how to fake it in order to teach, you don't know how to teach. Because it's not about your emotions. Right. It's not about you letting off steam. When my kids treat me disrespectfully, I need to teach them about respect. But I'm not allowed to blow off steam because I feel provoked and disrespected. 
Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. You're not a victim. The only victim in scripture is God, and he's fine with it for your sake. So how can you tell me how bad you've got it? Let me ask you, in order to tell me you have it so bad, what had to happen? And I don't mean philosophically what's going on in your ego. I don't care. I mean mechanically. In order for you to tell me how bad you've got it, what had to happen? I'll tell you. You had to draw breath because you had to push wind against your voice box and move your lips to make the sound that my brain interprets as you think you're having a hard time, which means you're not dead. So your complaint is non-functional for me because you're still breathing. That's scripture. Put down the burger and then tell me how bad you've got it. You know, and with so much suffering in the world, do you think that people would hear Paul? Instead, I have to endure Facebook posts trying to convince me that the Crusades were actually good. This is how people respond to other people's suffering by justifying the brutality of the Middle Ages? Because they want their tribe and their clan and their group to be elevated at the expense of fellowship with the other, beginning with the Muslim? This is the wisdom and the knowledge that Paul has to completely deflate. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth and the truth, as I've said many times, is your neighbor's thirst. Not your thirst, the way they present it in the cola commercials, but your neighbor's thirst. Father Mark, if it's true that I am nothing, and that I can't claim to be right, and that I can't achieve anything, and that everything comes from God, what's the point in me doing anything? This is the ego responding to the gospel because you want a justification to be a part of your church. And my response to that is, when you're thirsty, what do you do? Well, I, I drink water. When you're hungry, what do you do? Well, I eat. Why? Because I'm hungry. Okay, so you don't need a reason to eat except your impulse. All scripture is telling you is that you have to transfer that impulse to your neighbor. You don't need a giant, elaborate, philosophical justification for why you need to eat. Why do you need a bloody theology to show you that you need to make sure your neighbor eats? This is knowledge and wisdom without love. What is it supposed to matter for me? We were talking about love a minute ago. Now we're just talking about you. This is the difference. You stop talking about love. You stop talking about submission to your neighbor. You stop talking about service to the other. As soon as we stop talking about that, now we're the noisy gong. Love bears all things, trusts all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. If you follow the commandment to love, you might end up hanging on a stick outside the gates of Jerusalem, but you will not fail because it is the commandment and the promise of God that love is the fruit of the Spirit that brings life where there is death and brings light where there is darkness and brings hope where there is despair and fills emptiness with God's compassion for his people. Love cannot fail. You may fail, but love will not fail. And that makes your failure a martiria. That is the heart and soul of the content of the gospel. I think it's significant you use the word martyria because now that I'm thinking about it in this context, a martyria is a witness. It's proclaiming the truth of something else. Your death is nothing in itself. It's just another living thing passing away. You know, we step on how many ants as we walk across the grass and are killing things all the time. Things die. But only if it's a testimony to something else, which is the truth of love, then does it have some kind of meaning. Only then does it endure. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease, parenthetically, just like you. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. You are temporary. Your knowledge is temporary. Your actions are temporary. The commandment unto life is everlasting. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Man has eternity in his heart, the preacher tells us in Ecclesiastes but he cannot grasp it. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. So you better be joined to the perfect and not put your hope in the partial. 
And the partial, we know now what the partial is. It's prophecy without love. It's tongues without love. It's charity without love. We know what the partial is. Every counter argument you've given Father, all the counter arguments that Paul has given so far, it's those who want to figure out how things work, but they neglect their own self-abasement. They neglect the poor whom they're supposed to be serving. They neglect the deflation of their own ego. And then it becomes meaningless. Why? Because it's partial, because it's missing the very element that gives it life. The subtext here is that human beings are incapable of love and that it is only the divine commandment that can produce love because human beings are selfish. And if you are only motivated by your heart, which is how modern people talk about love, if you're only motivated by what comes from within you, then you are consigned to being partial because the love that scripture demands is inhuman. On this point, I disagree with the humanists, but I accept that their argument is coherent. They reject scripture because they believe in the human being. I reject humanism because I do not believe in the human being. And scripture is teaching you not to trust in the human being, but to trust in the divine commandment, which does not die. Which is why Jesus says in the Gospel of John, as we'll hear during Holy Week, and this is the commandment of God, eternal life. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child, meaning if you're still telling me how you feel about your girlfriend and whether you fell into love or out of love or how you feel when she does this or doesn't do this, you're still a teenager. I mean, come on, grow up. As my father, may he rest in peace, used to say, in the third world, you are an adult by the age of 16 because you have no choice. You can't dawdle until you're 35 as we do in the West. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. Okay? He's saying, now let's talk business. It's not about you. It's about your duty to the household. It's beautiful. It's such a beautiful way to talk about what it means to be a man or to be a woman. And at the same time, it reverses the understanding of the Roman household of what it means to be a man. Because what it means to be a man is to exercise power over others, authority over others. In Paul's terminology, it's always submitting in love. Now, that doesn't mean you can't speak with authority. It doesn't mean you can't teach with authority. It doesn't mean you can't punish with authority. But it's always out of submission to the good of the others. That's the difference. It can't be about your glory. It can't be about your strength. It has to be about the glory of the other and the strength of the other. And this is why you do what you do, even if you are the head of the household. For now, we see in a mirror dimly. Again, you have this desire for eternity in your heart, but you can't grasp it. It's such a functional phrase in 1 Corinthians. But then, face to face. So dimly in a mirror today, face to face when the Lord comes. Now I know in part, meaning I'm just taking instruction from my father, the Apostle Paul, and trusting in that instruction because I only see part of the picture, the way a child trusts their parents. I don't agree with what you're saying, mom and dad, but I have to trust that you have my best interests at heart, so I'm going to obey you. But then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known fully known in the sense of the story of Zacchaeus who did not see Jesus who was seen by Jesus fully known in the sense that you are called by the text you don't call the text very basic but now faith hope and love abide these three but among these three love is the greatest because faith which is trust and hope are in the future, love is what happens at your death. We'll see how much you love by the meaning that your death brings. What is the testimony that your death demonstrates? What does your death say? What does your death teach? Paul has shown us the most excellent way. Take care, Richard. Have a great week. Thank you, Father. You've just 
just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.